The Lord bless you, brethren, beloved. Welcome to another in our Bible study series. So good to have all the saints of God. I greet you all in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our great King who is coming back for us again very soon. So good to have us tuning in. Amen. As we delve into the word we are in the book of revelation and we have over the last few weeks been focusing on the seven churches right there in the book i believe it is an opportune time to do a little recap uh, from the very beginning those that are joining us know it is important that we know and understand that as we are looking at the churches, it is a part of a bigger picture um, in the book of Revelation. And we started out by way of review, and just a brief recap, we started out uh, by looking uh, at the book of Revelation. It is a, a very important book in the canon of scriptures. It's the only prophetic book we might say, in the New Testament. And it gives us a picture of things that are to come in the latter day. And many folks have held a view over the years that Revelation is a, a book of secrets. It is hard to understand. It is not possible to understand. And therefore, the advice that many, even in Christendom, gives is that we must not pursue trying to understand the book. It is hard to understand. It was not meant to be understood. And they hold fast to that view. The fact is, it is in the book that the Lord Jesus allowed us to have today. And as such, it has its role to play in allowing Christians to have a glimpse of the things that are to come, to have a snapshot of the Christ of Revelation. Uh, the book or the term Revelation is from the Greek apocalypsis, and it means an unveiling, an opening up, so that contrary to what many have put forward and many hold dear to, that it is a hidden book, the very name Revelation simply means to unveil or to unlock or to open up. And so there is nothing to hide in the book of Revelation. There is nothing that God was uh, locking away from his people. But everything was there to be opened up, to be unveiled, so that we might be clear on some things that are to come. Now, Revelation, we had outlined before gives us a panoramic overview of things that are going to transpire on this earth later on. And if we are not careful, we spend a lot of time looking at all the things that will be happening in Revelation because it speaks to some things that are going to come and the situation that is going to be on the earth at a certain time and the things that will happen when the church is raptured, taken out of the way and the rise of the Antichrist and the new system that is to come and the horrific experiences Amen. <clears throat> Sorry, that will emerge during this period. And because folks, uh, which is normal uh, tendency of humankind, because folks want to know what the future holds, uh, many spend a lot of time in Revelation trying to put together and size it up so that they can have a feel for what is to come in a little while. But while these things are true and they will come and these things will happen, it is important that we never lose sight of the fact that the book of Revelation is really the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not even the revelation of St. John, as many will probably try to let us believe. It was John that penned the book as the writer 
but the author was none other than the Almighty. And it was, in fact, according to the scriptures, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that the book of Revelation is really about Jesus. And so we indicated when we had just started that we must never lose sight of that fact. The focus of the book is about the wonderful Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with all the things that it says is going to happen at the end of it all. Jesus is going to be standing triumphant. He is going to be reigning eternally thereafter and the nations of the world and all of us will recognize his almighty power and the fact that Jesus our Lord is in charge and the day has finally come and the king would have revealed himself to all you know over time so the book of revelation the main focus is about our lord and the savior jesus christ and we must never lose sight of that fact we went further to pick out of the book i did indicate in the earlier uh, parts of the study that we will not be doing the book itself in terms of all the features and all the chapters, a chapter by chapter um, analysis and study, because we had gone through a lot of the things that are contained in the book in another study. But for the study that we are doing now, we wanted to extract out of the book of Revelation the seven churches, because we know and we are convinced that the experience of these seven churches has a lot in it that all of us today in the church can learn from. And we presented the fact that there were three prevailing views in looking at the subject of the seven churches in Revelation. There was what we call the historical view. Then there was the representative view, and then there is the prophetic view. And folks look through these three. The first two, which is the historical view and the representative view, we said that is, it is embraced by most students of the world, by most scholars, by most that are looking and studying the seven churches in Revelation. And so since we started, we have been spending time looking at the historical uh, view. And by historical, we mean that we are establishing the fact that the churches of Revelation were literal churches that existed in the first century. Amen. Over there in the Roman province of Asia Minor, which is today um, Turkey as we know it. They were literal churches. They had physical places where folks would go in and worship Almighty God. And without the shadow of a doubt, they can be traced and shown to be real, live, literal churches. They were not figurative. They did not have uh, meanings that were allegorical, but they were true, literal, physical churches situated in Asia Minor. And so by using the term historical view, we are understanding that we are presenting these based on the book as literal, seven literal churches. And we would have already started learning from them. By representative views, we were making uh, the point that these church represents the state of our own walk, amen, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The things that they experienced then are things that we are experiencing now. Very similar. And you will find, because you would have seen it for those that have been following from the start, that there were some things that Jesus focused on in the churches that we have already looked on. And as we go further, you will see continuing. He focused on some things that they were doing. And if the things were good, they got their commendation. If the things were bad, they got their rebuke. But their experience mirrors, amen, the experiences that we are having in our churches in the 21st century. And so 
the words of commendation, the words of rebuke, the general exhortation, the promises that were made to them uh, are applicable to us today who are experiencing the same kind of things that they experienced at the time. And so the representative view outlines these things and it is important that we understand that concept the the prophetic view uh, speaks to the spiritual history of the church from the time that john wrote amen the book of revelation right down to where we are those seven churches from the prophetic view represent the different church ages from that time until now some students of the word embrace that some do not and so we will get into the prophetic view you know at the the tail end of the study and we delve into it at that time so all that we have been looking at since we started with the church at ephesus have been the historical and the representative views and these are very important brothers and sisters, because they teach us a lot, right? We learn so much from our brothers and sisters in the first century. We find that there are common threads and the things that affected them then does affect us now. And I want us to know, I want us to understand that as we go through, we pick up and we see that even those that got their rebuke from the Lord Jesus Christ at particular, a particular point in the letter that was sent through the pastors to the churches, we see even for those that got rebuke, we see that they also got commendation. And it is signaling that for many, for all of us that is, it's not that we are all gone and we have no value. And if we are not doing what we are supposed to do, it means that we have done nothing at all correct in the eyes of Almighty God. God is a just God. And if he sees that we are doing well and at the same time we foul up, he is not going to just send rebuke for fouling up. His justice allows him to still commend us for the good that we would have done. But notice that in spite of the commendations, the good that we might have done, he does not hesitate to rebuke, to warn, so that we can establish ourselves on the right track. It is that he's saying, while you might be doing good, if evil is present, if the wrong is there, take stock of ourselves so that we can correct the wrong and balance ourselves. And that is a very important takeaway as we go through the churches. None of us need to be patting ourselves that I am an ardent worker and I am always in ministry because we can do that. And we see already Jesus commending some of the churches, for their works. And he said, I see your works. Nevertheless, I have a problem with you. And so in spite of the good that we might do, understand that after the commendation for most of the churches, there is a rebuke, meaning that he wants us to get our houses fully in order so that we are ready to leave in the twinkling of an eye. And so it is important, brothers and sisters, that we understand what is happening there. Uh, we, we had gone into the first church, which was the church at Ephesus, and we had made the point, and uh, again, I'm just saying by way of quick review, yes, we had made the point with Ephesus that it was a church that Jesus said, I know thy works, and he recognized and he commended for the, the zeal with which they carried out the works that they were doing. He commended them for the passion with which they were doing the things that pertained to the kingdom of God. And so it is important for us to be working for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
we will work for Jesus till the shadows part pass and the song goes on and we have many times amen vow that we are going to do this and we are going to accomplish for him and we are going to achieve for him and that is good the church at Ephesus were commended for what it is that they were doing amen and we give God thanks for that for being the God that he is sometimes in our weakness um, we become overcome with grief to the extent that we wonder if God is still going to talk to us but we see in Ephesus God speaking to the church there still and that was significant but although he commended them immensely we see where he made a very strong point in rebuking them nevertheless in spite of all the good things that you have been doing I have something against you. You have left your first love. And it is important, brothers and sisters, that we get the message, that we get the message straight, that we get the message clear. It doesn't matter what we are doing. It doesn't matter how much we are involved in ministry and involved in all the different things that we are doing. And they might be good genuinely good even accepted by the lord but in spite of all that good jesus is saying if love is not a part of your christian experience all the works essentially are in vain because he rebuked them and upbraided them because they had left their first love and I, we did say that that love is a love for God, a passionate relationship, fellowship with the Almighty God. And it is also a love that we must have one toward the other. If we neglect that love, if we forget that love, no matter how, and there are folks that take pride in the work that they do in building the kingdom and while that is accepted and acceptable if love is lacking it would have been a disaster at the end of the day so the key brothers and sisters saints of the most high god we must work for jesus till the shadows pass we must work for the master our hands are the only hands that he has, that he will use to accomplish his will. So working and being involved and doing what we are doing and ministering, it is a must. But doing it without love, because that can happen. We, we can be engaged and full, be fully occupied and there is uh, the absence of love at the end of the day will carry us as a church and as members individual members in the church it would profit us nothing so brothers and sisters we must follow what we would have learned here we have to be balanced in our walk with god nobody can dare say i don't love that one or I'm not into that one, or I'm not going to go along with that one simply because I dislike this particular person. We better get it into us to do what has to be done to love our brothers and sisters. And that is the, the basic lesson emerging, amen, from the church at Ephesus that we are taking the time and we had gone through, yes, and we had put, amen, to all of us. We had shown that those things are necessary. We had also gone over and we had looked at the, so we'd want to call the church at Ephesus, the church that is always working, the, the ardent church, the working church, the on the move church. And yet, with all of that, the absence of love, it profited nothing because we will never achieve the goal, no matter what we do, if love is not a part of the equation. Yes, and so we call Ephesus that working church, that active church, that church of involvement. But even with that, they lack love 
and were rebuked by the Lord. And so he is, in his rebuke, he spoke to them and sent them back to get back to, to repent and to get back to their first love or else. And those are strong words coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it signifies and signals the crucial importance of having love as a part and not just a part, but a critical part of our Christian experience. Lack of love, it doesn't matter what else is in the equation, it will not work. And if we have the love, because we are going to find as we go down into another church, we are going to find that Jesus commend them for, them for their love, but they were reprimanded and rebuked for something else. The, the key, brothers and sisters, is that our walk with God, as we are in the church, it must be balanced, it must be focused, and we must make sure. I would submit and suggest to all of us, take heed to these simple presentations in Bible study. They are for all of us. Don't underestimate the value and the potency of the things that are being taught right in these lessons as we go through. And we are going slowly, but it is worth going slow. Because I'm not just teaching and providing information. That is important. And we are providing the information. But not merely providing information. But just ministering to our souls. So that all of us can see and can feel and can understand. We, we need this thing to see right into our very being. And that is very, very, very important. And so we are teaching and providing information, but we are also ministering as we teach so that we can be edified and we can make the move to ensure that we become better Christians. Amen. And we give God thanks. Then we moved over to the church of Smyrna and we indicated that the church of Smyrna was the persecuted church. Yes, we in the presentation showed that they were in a city, Smyrna, that was rich. It had wealthy people. It was a rich city, wealthy people. But those that were in the church in Smyrna, they themselves were poor people. And they were under pressure. They were being constantly harassed. They were under severe persecution. And we find that even with the persecution and the constant trial and the constant, yes, heartache, the people maintained their faithfulness to God. And what was more, Smyrna means literally myrrh. And myrrh is one of the spices, we had said, that were used in the oil that gave it a sweet odor. The oil that they used to embalm dead bodies. Also, in the oil that they used in ministering within the tabernacle, that myrrh was a part of what they used to put together to make that special anointing oil that was used in the uh, tabernacle worship services. And to get that oil and to get the, the, the smell, that sweet smell, the sweet savor coming from the myrrh, the myrrh had to be crushed. And when it is crushed, the smell, the sweet perfume arose. And that was exactly what we said was happening to the church at Smyrna. They were persecuted. They were crushed. But while they were crushed, they maintained their faithfulness. And that faithfulness in the face of persecution and, and trials came up before Almighty God as a sweet-smelling savor with no doubt. And if we look as we did in the church at Smyrna, we find that they were commended. And for this church, there was no rebuke for them. And 
it signals something to us. It teaches us something, saints of the Most High God, as we continue recapping. It's teaching us something. It teaches us that even if uh, physically we don't have a lot of things, if materially we are short on a lot of things, that particular situation in life should not hamper us, should not hinder us, from being faithful to Almighty God. There are folks that say they will not come to church because they don't have any clothes. That's an excuse. Put away those excuses and come to church and serve the living God. Being poor and going through persecution and going through hardship is something that God is pleased with. And we do ourselves a disservice if we pity ourselves and say, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going into that and I'm not going to join with it because I don't have any shoes. Many of us went to church with holes in our shoes. Many of us went to church with one shirt for months upon months, one tie, one dress, one hat and still went through. We must recognize that making excuses and not coming is a sign of unfaithfulness. God loved the church at Smyrna and had no rebuke for them simply because in the face of every atrocity, everything levied against them, they were being killed, they were being persecuted simply because they held on to the name of Jesus and was faithful to it. When the emperors came and were pushing them to accept man worship, emperor worship, they rejected it at the cost of their own lives. And we have gone through all of that. And so at the end of the day, the lesson that we pull from the church at Smyrna is that whatever state we are in, poor, and there's something that we need to know. Because although physically, materially, they were poor, Jesus looked at them and said to them, you're poor, but you are strong. You are rich. Sorry, you are rich. So in the eyes of men, they were poor. They did not have much, much of the material things in this world. But in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were rich. So they were physically poor, but they were spiritually rich. And brothers and sisters, if we are spiritually rich, in this time especially, believe me, we have it going for us. And I encourage us, as we seek after things, as we walk with God, as we pursue righteousness, whatever it is that we must do to maintain our faithfulness to God in the face of any adversity, do it. We will be rich in the eyes of Almighty God. And that is really what matters. You know, men have nice things to say about us. But if men say nice things about us and God has something negative about us, Take it from me. We are in a bad place. It, there is no man great enough that can say something nice about me. And I embrace it and take it to heart. If I know that God dislikes and has a negative perception of who I am. No man can sympathize and give me comfort if I know that God is not happy with the things that I am doing. And so what is important, brothers and sisters, is that we take the time out and see the lesson. And the lesson is, whatever state you are in, be faithful to God. Be faithful to the business of God. Be faithful to ministry. And you would be surprised what that does, amen, to the Almighty God. When he sees you being crushed, like the church at Smyrna, the persecuted church, and they still maintain their integrity and their walk and their, their faithfulness to him. Amen. They passed, they passed being rebuked. And we say to God, be the glory, great things he has done. Then we had moved from the church at Smyrna and we were on to the church at Pergamos. And we started going through. We started uh, looking at the church at Smyrna. And we were going through the, his 
the church, sorry, at, of Pergamos, and we were going through the history, and we had gone, <coughs> sorry, uh, to a particular point. You would have observed last week that we, towards the end, interrupted, because sometimes I go a little bit long, and I did not want to go long, and I actually asked our producer if I was going over the time to cut me, and he did that, and that was fine. But I know where we stopped, and so we will pick up from there. But we made mention that where the church of Pergamos was concerned, it was the compromising church. And we see that Jesus had some words for this church at Pergamos. And it is important that we understand every one of these churches, yes, every one of them uh, had some things about them except we just mentioned Smyrna, there was no rebuke for them, but commendation. But as we look through, we see that Jesus coming along had some things to say to all of them. And as we look at the things that Jesus said to them, we now put ourselves in a place to see if they apply to us. Because again, in Pergamos, there are lessons to be learned there. We had gone to the point where we looked, and I'm going to bring on the screen the words of commendation because we had taken time and we had gone through and we had shown some things and we will take it up from the commendation that Jesus made uh, to the church at Pergamos. And from there, we are going to move and we might just, as we go through, review a few of the things that we said last week and then continue on where I cut off from and then proceed onwards. So let's, let's look at the uh, screen and see the chart there. We want to look at the words of commendation that Jesus had. So the screen is up and we are all looking at the screen. And so we see what does Jesus know about the church at Pergamos? Amen. He knows their works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne or Satan's seat is. He knows that they hold fast his name. He knows that they did not deny the faith. In, and then he made the point that Antipas is faithful martyr. Yes, was killed among them right there in the church at Pergamos. So he sees all these things. And this is what we are saying about the Lord Jesus Christ. That he, in as much as he has issues that he's pointing out because the church belongs to him. And there are things that he will not condone. But even though he will not condone them, if he sees that we are trying and if he sees that we are doing some things worthy of commendation. He is going to commend. And he did just that. Amen. To the saints that were from the church of Pergamos. He saw and he knows their work. And listen, brothers and sisters. I might use the opportunity now to make the point. That Jesus knows all that we are doing. He knows where you are. He knows where we go to church. He knows where the churches are. He knows those that have denied him. Amen. At places of work and school. He knows. He knows those who are willing to defend his name against those that are around to destroy it. He knows. He knows everything about the church. He knows everything about us personally. And that is very important, brothers and sisters, that we know that he knows. And so, listen to what is said here. And I will just, to, at point B, in point A says, I know their works. And then B says, and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. What does that mean? We said when we met last week, that right there in Pergamos, there was a particular uh, temple. Because there were many of them. But there was one in particular that had as its symbol, its logo, its, its banner, a serpent. And many believe that this particular temple 
represented a central area of operation for the works of darkness. Satan was like headquartered in this particular place. And so right there in Pergamos, there were temples galore. And yet there was one that seemed to be the temple above temples. And the serpent we know is symbolic of Satan himself. It was, look at the book of Genesis. Look at what happened early in the, in, in, in the, in, in the early chapters of Genesis. It was the serpent that did what he did with Eve. And that serpent was symbolic of Satan himself. And it is no small wonder that right here it talks about where Satan's throne is. And that particular temple with the serpent is believed by many scholars to be that central area that Satan and his minions operated from. And of course, he used men. So it was like a power base for those workers of darkness to do their things and then to go out into the city and to ply their trade and to do what they had to do as workers of darkness. And so right there where the workings of Satan was intense, where the underworld activity was at its strongest, right in the midst of that, guess what? A church was there, and that church had the commendation of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that church was actually held in the hands of Jesus. A lot of things we can learn from these brothers and sisters, and it is important. I want us to be maturing, amen, as saints of the Most High God. You know, I want us, as we go through these things, we make the notes, and we go through them, and we, we rivet them in our minds, because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a puny, puny. It's not just to go set up a building and set up something there and just put up a pulpit and sing a song or two. This is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the place where God resonate and work from and establish his presence this is the place where jesus said i will upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail so it is a powerful body and with church when the lord directs and it is established it is established it don't matter if it is up in beverly hills or it is down in the in the in the ghettos of downtown Kingston where the guns are barking. I want us to understand that the church is the church and every power is subject to that higher power. And that church that was there at Pergamos, I want us to understand that they were right where Satan's seat was and they were carrying out the work of the ministry and they were glorifying God and they were lifting up the name of Jesus. And listen, one of the things he commended them for right where they were is that they held fast his name. In other words, they were defending his name even against those workers of darkness that were anti-Jesus and opposed to everything that Jesus stood for. They, that church there in the midst of where they were and the demonic activities that no doubt were taking place there. The church was there and the church was vibrant and the church was strong. A precious saint spoke to me recently, you know, and we, you know, we were sharing a blessed saint. And we were sharing and the concern came, you know, that, you know, if we go to a certain place, they, there is a strong working of spiritual, spiritual things, you know, and it might fight against the church. Listen, anywhere you go, you're going to have fight against the church, brothers and sisters. And if we go right where the thing is, we would have been just like Pergamos, where Satan's seat is. But we don't run away from that. No, brothers and sisters, we don't run away from that. If the church must be at a particular place, if Satan's seat is there, then like Pergamos, let the church be the church. The head of the church is Christ. And when it comes unto Jesus, every power will have to be subject unto the higher power. So we are very cognizant of that. For God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I just want to comfort the hearts of 
you know, my brothers and my sisters, the precious saints of God, if there is any concern, if there is any worry that, you know, as we go one place or another, we might have a lot of attacks or the workings of darkness might be strong in one place compared to another. Let not your heart be troubled. This is the church of the living God. If we don't go to one place and we go to another, if we don't go here and we go there or wherever we go, it's not because we're running from darkness workings. It's not because we're running from underground workings. Anywhere where God allows the church to go. I thank God. You know, there's many folks don't know the kind of warfare that takes place when a church is in the inner city. And, you know, Pastor King has gone down to Majestic Temple, right down on Spanish Town Road there. He is in the midst of uh, different factions within the inner cities. Over one side you have Maxfield, over another side you have Rose Lane, over another side you have Greenwich Farm or Greenwich Town. And further down you have Tivoli and of the, not too far you have Re My God, that and then in the midst of all of that, there are folks, in the midst of all of that, there are folks that to protect those men that are considered to be leaders of communities, we call them dons, dun to protect these people, they have to be involved in works of darkness. And so they go to this Obia man or to that Obia woman and they get the oil of this and they get special bath and they, 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 those that are in the gangs at this particular place and that particular place and that particular place and that particular place, they all have their special reader woman and reader man and obia man and necromancy worker to protect them so that the spiritual work of darkness in that area is so strong. But guess what? There is a church there. And that church, just like the seven churches that were there, in Asia Minor, in the hands of Almighty God, typifies that even the church at Majestic Temple is in the hands of God. Even though there is gang warfare, there is obia workings, there is, there is satanic activities, the church is there and the church is thriving. I want to encourage all of us. Don't watch where Satan working or where Satan seat is. That can't stop the church. Let the church be the church. And let the people rejoice. And Pergamos was a church like that. Right in the heart. Of where all these things were happening. And so we see Jesus commended them. For all that they did. Yet. Having said what he said. A serious part of Jesus emerged. And he now confronts them and says, here is the problem. Here is the rebuke. And we, we bring the screen up the next slide. Here is the word of rebuke. Amen. That I have for you. Amen. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have there those who hold the doctrine of of Balaam. No, that is significant. That is significant. Balaam, we know, was a prototype of all corrupt teachers. We know the history, we know the story of Balaam. And we had gone through it when we met the last time. But the essence of it is that while a particular king, Balak, wanted to curse Israel. It could not happen because God already blessed them. So Balaam, that Gentile prophet, recognizing that he could not fight against the children of Israel as they were walking with God, and he could do nothing to cause God to harm them, and to curse them so long as they were walking with their God. He presented to Balak a solution. 
He said, look, here is how I'm going to cause these people to curse without me having to curse them. We're going to cause the daughters of Moab and the daughters of Midian to go over into their midst and to mix up with them and to just mingle with them and allow for their lives and their systems and their operation to come together and, 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 and be one, so to speak, so that is essentially teaching and essentially presenting a doctrine where they teach the, 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 the mixing of the things of Moab and Midian with the things that were taught to the children of Israel. And by mixing it, it will water down and compromise the strong position that the children of Israel had in relation to certain things. God told the children of Israel not to marry to any of those people. God told, which is the Moabites and the Midianites and any of those people from the nations of the world. God told them not to participate in any of the religious activities that they were engaged in. Because what would happen is that they would pervert the purity, amen, of the doctrine of the gospel. And, and I say gospel not in terms of New Testament gospel, but I say what he taught to Israel, the words that he taught to them, what he presented them through the books of the law. He said, you are separate, you are distinct, you are mine, and I want you to maintain the separation. And they were. And guess what? Balaam presented a situation to Balak. And they allowed the children and the wives to go off, off, or the ladies, the women of Moab, to go over into Israel and to mix up and to mingle with the men. And before long, the men started to marry. And some of them weren't even married. And they started to sleep with the ladies from Moab and Midian. And before you know it, the ladies from Israel started to take, take the men from these other heathen, heathen nations of the world. And there was a massive compromise. And that compromise marked the destruction of the special arrangement that was in place with, between God and his chosen people, Israel. It was not from outside, but it was from within in that they allowed for compromise so that they compromise the very word of God that was given to them and that made them distinct and separate and before long they were like everybody else to the extent that idol worship was brought in because whenever there is compromise then there is idolatry whenever there is compromise and we lose and shift our focus from almighty God then there is idolatry and there is immoral immorality and that is the error the doctrine of Balaam 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 combined the sins of immorality and idolatry to please Balak the king of Moab because he knew that he could not curse Israel directly and that rebuke that Jesus had for Pergamos was very 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 significant because they accepted something that was absolutely absolutely wrong and listen listen i have on the screen point number two they also have those who hold the doctrine of the nicolaitans and it was almost a similar thing where the nicolaitans were known to teach that um, it, what is important is not the body, is not the flesh, but the spirit, the soul, the inner man. So once that inner man has a relationship with God, the, the flesh was made to gravitate to natural things and sex and other natural things are biological and therefore nothing is wrong with it. And they made it out that fornication and adultery was a norm because it is just the nature of the flesh and we can't chastise ourselves for doing what is natural 
for doing what the, bo the body naturally desires to do. But if that happens, at least make sure that your soul and spirit is in tune with God. And so this is a doctrine of the devil to cause people to see sins as not sins, to see things that are wrong as being right and accepting these things as normal and maintaining their walk as they think with God in the church. And Jesus had to rebuke them because he's saying that, look, you have accepted these teachings and you have, and you have not only done them, the problem that Jesus had wasn't only with the people that were engaged with these things. But if you notice the rebuke, you know, he says, he's saying, and it therefore encompass those who do it and those who condone it. Because he said, you have there those that hold the doctrine of Balaam. So some of them might not even actually do the thing, but they know about it and they love it. And they can't do on it. And they're, they're, they're with the folks as if everything is all right. And I'm sub submitting to us, saints of the Most High God. I am submitting to all of us that we need to know. We need to know that it is not only the people that do the actual thing. But you see, those that can't do on it know that it is wrong. But we pretend that it is okay and we want to advance the folks. There are some people that know some folks are literally living in sin. And if you ever dare say you're going to talk to them, make another brother or another sister talk to them. They join with the folks who take you on and say, what? It is happening all around in other churches and nothing do wrong with it. And this brother over, in other words, they are giving you reasons why it must remain. You're going to have a problem with God because Jesus is saying, look here, you hold the doctrine of Balaam and you hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitan. I have somewhat against you. And he said, listen to me now. Hear the judgment part of it. And having said that, Jesus now turned to those particular saints, not only the ones that do the thing, but those that hold that doctrine. They know it is there. They know it is happening. And they can do on it. They, they never speak out against it. They never stop it. And you ever dare try to stop it. And they, they form the clique and say, this one is talking and pastor saying this and that one over there is doing it. And they know we are in trouble with Jesus. For hear what Jesus said now. Jesus wants the saints of Pergamos to understand that one, you better repent. This thing is serious. This this thing where certain teachings are coming in that nothing is wrong with certain kind of lifestyle and it is the norm because everybody else, every other church is doing it. Hello, we need to be very, very, very careful how we measure ourselves and who we use as measuring stick because sometimes we use a short stick and we miss the mark. Let the word of Almighty God be our measuring stick and let us place ourselves at the word and let it mirror who we really are and who we are supposed to be. Let it be the measuring stick. And I want us to understand that Jesus said to repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Can you imagine Jesus going to fight against Christians with his word? The sword is talking about the word. So Jesus is going to use that very word and fight against you. I wouldn't want to be a Christian person that Jesus fight against. Because if Jesus fight against your enemy, I'm sorry for that enemy. But just imagine if Jesus fight against you. Guess what? I am sorry for you. And Jesus said, if you don't repent, those Christians in Pergamos, those Christians today that are embracing these uh, particular doctrines that you feel give you freedom and license to sin and license to do certain things. And in the past, we were held in bondage. Bondage? To live right? To flee fornication? To flee worldly loss? Bondage? 
When it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Bondage? No, no, no. Don't be fooled, brothers and sisters. These are doctrines that Balaam put together to cause the people to compromise, to compromise their walk, to compromise their position, to compromise their status with Almighty God. Don't listen to these lying doctrines. Don't listen to these people who tell you that everything is all right and they were holding you in bondage. It is not bondage to hate the world. On the contrary, it is bondage to love the world. Because then the love of the Father will not be in you. And so we want to stick to the word. We want to stick to the old landmark. We want to stick to the truth of the word. Forget those things and those doctrines and those people. Compromise is a serious thing. That is what caused the door. Let me tell you how bad it was. It reached to the point back then with, with Balaam and Balak. That after the compromise, after the mingling and the mixing and all of those things that happened, it got so bad that the people now came right at the tent door. An Israelite man and a Moabitish woman. And at the tent door, the tent, you know, the tabernacle door, where the worship of God takes place, where they were to go in and offer sacrifices at the door at the place where God would normally meet the meeting place they lie out there and were in the act of fornication or adultery right in the house of God compromise and mingling and loving the things of the world cause us to lose our sense of separateness our sense of belonging to god our sense of innocence it caused our consciences to be seared with a hot iron to the extent that we will be right in church and go into the bed of fornication and adultery and get up and then come church come sing sunday and come church come preach and come church come run up and down the aisles like nothing didn't happen that is what Compromise does. And I challenge any saint of God. If we indulge in this. If we allow for this to happen in our lives. One of these days when we're singing. Yeah. One of these days when we're playing. One of these days when we're preaching. One of these days when we're teaching. One of these days when we're running up and down. Watch and see what God is going to do. God actually... And the same thing that he said in giving his rebuke to Pergamos, where he said, I'm going to fight against you. He literally fought against the children of Israel back there after they had gone into this state of compromise and mixing up with everybody else. He fought against them because after what happened there with that man and that woman right in the tabernacle, right there at the tent, right in church, if we might just use the term. A, a man took a javelin and came over to them and physically ran them through. Ran them through and it appeased God. I mean, the thing had became so out of whack. And I want us to understand that those doctrines that are coming in that no is saying nothing is wrong if you do this. Nothing is wrong if you do that. Nothing is wrong to do every single thing in the world that the Bible says we mustn't do. There are no bringing up scriptures that say it didn't mean that. What it meant was that you can do it, but don't go overboard. And so folks are running up and down, looking all over the place for places that give them this freedom. But I want to encourage the saints that I have to teach and that I have responsibility for. Saints of God, you, you stick to the old way 
And I'm not suggesting that you're old people. I'm not suggesting that we are away from modern living. We are not. You would see that we have moved with the times and we have introduced what needs to be introduced to move with the times. But there are some things. We can change even the, the methods. We can change the different things of evangelism. These are days when we are on YouTube. These are days when we are on WhatsApp. These are days when we are on Facebook. These are days when we are on Instagram and we can use these things, these platforms to share gospel truth. And we are moving with the times. But let me tell you, while the methodologies will change, I want us to understand that some of the, fund, the foundational things, the fundamental things cannot and will not change. And if we are looking for those things to change, listen, our eyes going to drop out. It's not going to change. And I want us to understand there has to be separation. The things that are God and the things that are opposed to God cannot be the same. And God spoke in the Old Testament times. He spoke about his people being different, different in their attire. Did you know that God to Israel back there spoke to them about the very clothes that they wear? Did you know that God back there spoke to them and about their very appearance. Did you know? And this is not because he wants anybody to be in bondage, you know. This is because he wants us to act different and to look different and to be different and to be separated to him and for him because we belong to him. Do not let anybody fool you. And as a result of those doctrines that have been introduced some people are fooled to believe you want to see some people going to church these days and they tell you they tell you it's not about clothes it's about you of course it's not about clothes but that don't mean you mustn't wear clothes in fact this thing is taken to the extent that folks wear in the states people wear shorts and 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 some things go to church you wouldn't be i'm gonna say shorts and i'm not even talking men i'm talking ladies and it's nothing wrong with that because we're just going to worship god a little mingling, a little mixing, a little compromise, not even our consciences, which can speak to us and tell us many times. I challenge any man and any woman, you put on something that feels inappropriate and you walk up the road and something telling you something not right. Something not right. Something in here is telling you something not right. You ever put on a little half altar, I forget what they call it. And go out there as a, as a daughter of Zion and just walk and say, it's not about my clothes. If they ever see my mind, if they ever see my heart, they, they would know that I am all for God. All for God? You're not all for God. You're for, because your conscience is telling you that something is wrong. And so those that come with these things to water it down and to let you feel good and to grow the numbers in their assemblies, hello, let us be very careful. So Jesus said, repent or I will fight against you. And God caused a plague to come upon the people and thousands of them died. He fought against them. Then, and here in the New Testament church at Pergamos, he said, I will fight against you with my word. And he will use the word. And it is the word that he can use that will cause men to fall. You know that same word? And it is two-edged. So that word can save men or that word can cause your soul to be damned. The same word that save can destroy. And if he fight against you with his word, I want to know who can stand against the word of Almighty God. And so I challenge the saints of the Most High to look at the promise now of Jesus, having made clear his absolute disgust at what was happening in Pergamos. And the fact that they must repent, he now comes with a promise of reward. And I want us to look at it. Jesus told them that he that overcomes, I will give him a white stone 
and a white stone is, is, is a simple stone that was there in those times that sy symbolized if your name went on that you know people who were convicted uh, all of a sudden the community discarded them and they would feel embarrassed their heads would be low their families uh, would be ashamed because they were convicted at, of a particular thing or charged I should say, not convicted, but charged with a particular offense. But then if they go to court and they are acquitted in the court, in other words, they have the trial and it was shown, it was proven that what they were charged for, they were not guilty of and they were acquitted of that particular crime or that particular issue, then they, that acquittal and the person going out, it, it would not just be something that the court hear of the acquittal. But guess what? All those that they were embarrassed in front of would know that this, peop this person was no good because he has been acquitted. And his name would be written upon a white stone. It is a little stone, a uh, square slab, amen, that was put from time to time out there in Pergamos. That, uh, that little slab would have names of folks who were either acquitted or if a man... Uh, excelled in a sporting event. Sometimes instead of getting the, the particular trophy, his name was placed on the white stone so that it was a stone that signified an uh, elevated position, one of acquittal or one of triumph, one of winning something significant. And so your name at that time going on a white stone meant something positive meant something big meant something extremely important jesus said to the folks who knew what the white stone was that if you dare to overcome i will give him a white stone and on that stone a new name his name will be written on it but not his old name his new name that no one knows except him who receive it and that was a great blessing that was a, a something to look forward to by the saints at Pergamos who knew what that white stone represented and so to the children of God what are we taking away even from the reward that I dare us to overcome I dare us we, we want us to hold on we want us to hold on amen to the the promises of 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 Jesus that he will give to him a white stone and on that stone he will have a new name written we want us to understand that look saints of God the church at Pergamos had their issues. The church at Pergamos had their ups. They had their downs. But it was a compromising church. And if we compromise this gospel, if we compromise our walk with God, if we compromise our position as a son of God, we are going to find that the Lord will use that two-edged sword and fight against us. I don't want that to happen. You don't need for that to happen. What is important, brothers and sisters, is that we recognize that Jesus wants us to be separate. He wants us to maintain our spiritual purity. He wants us to maintain our walk with him. But, and we are going to do this when we recognize who we are and also recognize whose we are. We are not like the world and we are not boasting on the world, but we are just stating a fact because it is biblical and we don't love the world nor do we love the things of the world those that are in the church that still have a seed in their system that 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 is of the world let us eradicate it totally if we dare to do that through fasting and prayer and the word and and constantly trying to maintain fellowship with God and eradicate that seed the desire for the world will go. Once that worldly desire is there, that thing that Satan used to capture your imagination, and uh, I'm praying for all of us, I'm praying for all of us, that every seed, every worldly seed, that sometimes is a little speck, 
but oh that it will be eradicated so that even the desire for the things of this world will go so that we can know that we are separated we are chosen a chosen generation a royal priesthood a peculiar people a holy nation mean we're separate from the world and we are separated from them and we are separated unto god and we must understand that no mixing and mingling with the worldly things to make us compromise our walk with god and i challenge us children of the most high god and so that is very very important amen that we read and the, the last thing on the screen let us just bring it up for us to look at quickly he that has an ear to hear he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches the danger let us let us look at the lesson again another lesson coming out the general exhortation and yet a lesson to us he that has an ear the danger let us be aware of this the danger of false teaching and immoral conduct be very careful it is still pervasive in the church today teaching that make us have the feeling that nothing is wrong if i do this one time or if i do this just a few times or if i do it and it's not like i am going out of the way it is just normal biological need well jesus said don't do it the bible says it is wrong the bible says it wars against the soul and over and over it goes on to explain that certain things must not even once be named among us as become a saints and it is important be weary and so i am putting this church our church on serious alert listen out watch out for those that are coming with teachings doctrines that will try to give you the feeling that everybody had you in bondage all these years and it is wrong and what's supposed to happen is that you're supposed to be free to worship god let no man judge you in relation to how you look we're not judging anybody we're just using the word and presenting the word they could have said it back there when god gave them their code to look different from the people that were around them god wanted Israel to be totally different from the heathens around them and to that extent they were different in practically everything their mode of worship was different the food that they eat was different the clothes that they wear was different um, it was just a different people they were set apart and it is the same thing notice that that scripture that peter used in peter when he spoke about you're a chosen generation it was a scripture that was taken from old testament that referred to israel he used it now to refer to us so that god still has a separated people a chosen people who look different act different worship different we take our bibles different we are different and any doctrine that seeks to bring us closer to the world and nothing is wrong with this and everything is right with this and bring us closer to the system of the world the music and everything anything that tries to close the divide that the bible has established between the world and the church be weary and i put our church on notice i put all the people that love god that watch this bible study on notice that there is an attack against the apostolic church right now and i want us to understand that we better take these bible studies carefully you see how covid came and things that we used to take for granted, like coming to church, oh, I can't bother to go to church, week after next, I go. And now it is almost a precious thing. Man writing down name, left, right, and center. People calling upset because they've never come 
week before last and why them have to go wait one more week is it's like we miss church so much that we, we, we're fighting to come this thing is precious and sometimes we don't understand the value of what we have until we lose it and i'm saying just coming to church by itself is precious but you see the word of god you see the good book the bible you see the things in it that jumps at us as we take our time and we go through and we expound the word and we teach the word brothers and sisters do not take it lightly and i put us on notice and I want every strong apostolic saint in our ministry, not just in Faith Chapel here, but in the ministry right across. Faith Majestic, thank God for the pastor that they have. Faith Chapel Ascot, thank God for the pastor that they have. Faith Chapel Kelowna, thank God for the pastor that they have. The work over in Africa, thank God for the pastor that they have. We are in this thing to instill in our hearts. Let us be on the alert. Take these teachings seriously. Go back through them. See what Jesus is saying to the church. Apply them to our lives. We're going to run upon something shortly. And I see coming. And I'm saying to us, let us treat with these things seriously. I go over to the church at Thyatira because there are lessons there for us. And let us put it up on the screen because we are going to read now. And let's turn to the scripture there in Revelation, Revelation chapter number 2. Right? We are going right over into Thyatira. We will not finish it this evening, but we will see how far into it we go because I'm not going overboard. Amen. As I did the last time. But let us read together. Yes, Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to take our time and just read the scriptures together. It is important that we get that feel, amen, from the scriptures. And so, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things say the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know, here it is, Jesus is saying it again, I know thy works and charity and service and faith. They are being commended, you know, and notice this particular church is being commended for their love and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Tyathira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my words, Unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches and this is a an extremely long letter 
Amen. In comparison to the others. In fact, it is the longest letter and one of the most intense letters written to any of the churches. Amen. And it is important that we understand that. And so, the, as we did with the others, we looked at the history, amen, of the particular city. And Tyathira, again, we will do the same. And we recognize that Tyathira was the smallest and the least importance of the cities, those that we have looked at already and those that we are to look at. Of the seven of them, Tyathira was the smallest and uh, the least important. And it is important that we make note. So you can have the church, and I mentioned it before, but I mentioned it against a background where the church was in a particular location where Satan's seat was. We mentioned the church in another instance in Smyrna, um, <clears throat> in Ephesus. We mentioned them in other backgrounds where the city was rich and where there the city was like a center uh, for cultural activities. And so these are nice places in terms of the beauty of the place. Uh, some of these cities before were like um, centers of learning where there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of volumes of books. And some of them, as I said, were rich in terms of the economic activities that was generated within the cities. But then here, Tyatira, unlike even others that were like political centers, Tyatira was small and it was insignificant. In fact, the least of the seven. And yet a church was here. So whether it is a metropolis, whether it is a political center where there is activities of the highest political order, whether it was a city steeped in demonic activities, the church can be planted and can thrive in any condition. And Thyatira was no less a, a, a most insignificant city, but yet the church was there, right? There were no big temples here when we compare it to some of the other cities that we had looked at before. But then they had a particular god who's, and who was Apollo, and he was worshipped as the guardian of the city. And that was very important. As we go on, we, we will realize, you know, that in, in history, there is no record that the Christians of Thyatira suffered anything significant in comparison to what happened over there in Smyrna, where they were persecuted and where they suffered. There was nothing to suggest that there was anything major in terms of um, suffering and persecution, etc. And so the, a small city, the church was there, but they were just going through. But notice that in this small city, there was still that concept of emperor worship. It was required because they saw the emperor as the incarnation of Apollo or the son of Apollo. And so they, they, they had this title for the emperor that he was a son of Zeus. And as a result of that, people looked on the emperor as a most powerful person. And actually, as a god, and as a son of the bigger God, Zeus himself. And that was very significant because as we go on, we are going to look back at how Jesus introduced himself when he spoke to this particular church, the church at Tyatira. If we can recall in the scripture that we read, Jesus was saying, and unto the angel of the church in Tyatira write, these things saith the Son of God. This is the only one of the churches that he introduced himself as the Son of God. I wonder why he would do that. When we look at the, the, what was happening here in Tyatira and seeing the, the God Apollo and Zeus being worshipped and the emperor being seen as the Son of God, of 
Zeus himself. Then they were seeing the emperor in an exalted position as the son of God, the God Zeus himself. Jesus was now writing to the church and saying, look here, forget about this emperor. I mean, he never said it in, that, in those terms in the scripture here. And but in essence, he was saying, look here, he introduced himself as the son of God, a total opposite to what was being taught all around in Thyatira, that the son of God was the emperor himself. Jesus was saying, I am the true son of God. I am the one that you ought to see as the son of God, not the emperor who is being banded around as the son of Zeus. I am the son of God. And then he went on to say, who starting to describe himself now as the one who has eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are to find brass, etc., etc., etc. So we, I wanted to make that link for us to recognize that although in this city they actually have the emperor as a son of Zeus, Jesus countered what was the accepted belief by the, the people of the city about the emperor. Jesus is telling the church, reject those claims. I am the son of God. And that was a, an extremely important point to make. Um, Thyatira was famous for uh, the manufacture of purple dye. It was in this particular city, right? It was in this particular city that a particular woman and Acts chapter 16 speaks about her. You remember Lydia from the book of Acts? Acts chapter 16 verses 14 to 15. It's, it's, it, it actually speaks about this person. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us, right? Um, she was a seller of purple from the city of Tyatira, the same city we are talking about. All of this is happening in the book of Acts. You know? So while these churches were here and activities, I want us to see the link, the nexus in you know, the saints of God. Tyatira was a literal place, alive and well and thriving. And a church was there so that while the apostles were doing their work over there in the book of Acts and the apostle Paul was alive and well. It was believed that over the entire Thyro, Paul or the lady herself, Lydia, having learned from Paul, actually went over back to her city in Thyatira. And history has it that she founded the church there. This was a woman. And it is not strange. It is not strange that ladies actually went that far in establishing and opening churches. I don't know if ultimately she was the pastor or later on how it was passed on, but it is believed by many historians that she was the founder of the church in Thyatira. And so here in Acts 16, it says, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. It is believed that when she went back to her house in Tyathira and the apostle Paul went there also, that church was established right in her house with this lady. The church was established. And so... Notice that she was a seller of purple from Tyatira. So the city, in terms of history, was known as a famous uh, manufacturing center for purple dye. And that is significant to note. Um, <clears throat> that is very, very significant to note. I, I wanted to make the point now that Jesus describing himself to the church in Thyatira describes himself thus one the son of God I just explained to us why to counter the notion that the emperor was the son of Zeus or the son of the, 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 the God of gods no he was 
not. And the Son of God was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And he describes himself in this way, as usual, to give a particular attribute of himself to address the need that was evident in this particular church. Every one of the churches that had a particular situation, Jesus described a particular attribute of himself to meet and counter that particular uh, thing that was there that was presenting itself as something opposed to who Jesus was. So if, for example, here in Thyatira, it is said that the emperor was the son of Zeus and the, the son of God, Jesus countered that and present himself as the true son of God. And then it went on, he went on to describe himself as he who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. And we want to, to make that point abundantly clear that he is the son of God and nobody else. His eyes were like flame of fire and it is important that Jesus described himself in this particular way because what Jesus was actually um, alluding to when he talks about his eyes being like flames of fire. It is talking about his penetrating look, his penetrating power. Right? Brothers and sisters, it does not matter who we are. Jesus can look right through us. Notice that it, in the scripture that we read, it speaks about him being the one who searches the heart and the rain. Brothers and sisters, we look at you we look at each other and we make a judgment call based on what we see of the person based on what we know of the person brothers and sisters jesus doesn't need for anybody to tell him about any of us. His eyes is like a flame of fire, which means it's burning, piercing look. He can steer right into our souls. And he sees and searches the heart and the rain. In other words, he looks at not only the things that we do, he looks at not only the things that we think and then the action we take, but hearts and rain mean that he goes deep and looks at the very motive, the very motive that guides us to do certain things. Be careful, brothers and sisters, as we do what we have to do. Let us be cognizant of the fact that Jesus searched the heart and the reins. He looks at motives. He looks at why we do what we do. And he said to the church at Thyatira, which is in this instance the corrupt church, and we will I'll outline to us why it is positioned as the corrupt church. And he looks and tells them that with piercing eyes, I search the heart and the rain. And that is very important. And then having said that, notice he now says, his feet is like fine brass. And we know from the scriptures in Old Testament that brass represents judgment. Yes, brass is a heavy metal. And we know that, that the weight of brass it speaks also to the fact that Jesus is unmovable. And when it comes to judgment, the brass represents judgment. So this unmovable Jesus is going to having searched the hearts and reins, having looked at us, and look through us with that eyes like fire piercing through. Having made his determination, he is going to judge as he alone can. And I want us brothers and sisters to understand that and to be careful that yes, 
we know with whom we have to deal. And brothers and sisters, saints of the Most High God, let us understand that he's watching you. He's watching me. That piercing eyes like fire right now is watching what you're doing right now. Is looking at what is in your heart right now. What you're gearing up to call your friends to talk about right now. And he's seeing it. And he's taking note. Because at a certain point, that feet like brass is going to stand up. He's going to put down those feet like brass. And that means judgment is going to come. And he spoke these things not to the people in the world who are committing all the atrocities and killing and maiming people. No, not to the world. To the church. To the people in Thyatira. He's presenting himself as the son of God to counter all those who are calling themselves sons of God. They don't know what they're talking about. But then he's also presenting himself as he who has eyes like a flame of fire. Search, burn, penetrate deep and then looks into the heart and the reins and goes through the marrow and sees every secret thing that we do. Sees every secret thought that we harbor. Thought to destroy. Thought to tear down. Thought to disrupt. And listen. If we think we can disrupt the work of God, listen to me. This church belongs to him and to him alone. And we cannot, under any circumstance, cannot, never will be able to destroy the move or the work of Almighty God. Take the word. We can't do it. God is sovereign. And not even Satan with all the plans that he has. And with all the strategic moves that he has made. He cannot upset the plan of Almighty God. Our God is sovereign. And he is not held in check by Satan. And if Satan cannot do it. Angels were made higher than us. And although God has directed his attention to the human family. And has died for us. And has secured salvation for us. And when we are over yonder. And have, would have left this place. It is going to be eternity. Forever and forever. Although God did that for us. The fact is. Angels were made higher than us. We were made according to scriptures. A little lower than the angels. And if the angels cannot stop. The plan and the work and the move of Almighty God. You and I can't do it. Stop fooling ourselves. And let us band together. And let us understand that he sees his eyes burn and pierce. And go right into our minds and our hearts. And search and plan to do what he's going to do with us by virtue of what he sees in us. I wonder what it is that God sees deep within us when that piercing eye burns into our souls at this moment. I wonder what he sees being formulated in our minds and in our hearts towards our brother or towards our sister or towards the work of God. I wonder, and like the church at Thyatira, it is important that we understand who he is. Presents himself as the son of God. Whose eyes are like a flaming fire. And whose feet are like fine brass. Getting ready when the time is right. To execute judgment in the church. Let us be extremely careful. As we move to the next slide. And I'm, I'm going to wrap up now. Because I... Recognize that the time is drawing. 
down. As we move to the next slide, I want us to look. I want us to look. And let us put the slide up that everybody can see the slide as we move up together. Amen. I want us to note saints of God. And we'll just slip it down to the next slide that speaks to the commendation. Um, amen. Of the church at Tyathira. Jesus again makes a significant point. He says he knows. What, did, what does he know? He knows their works. He knows their love. He knows their service. He knows their faith. He knows their patience. And then he goes on to say, as for works, the last are more than the first. So, let's look a little deeper at the five essential qualities. And we are continuing with the words of commendation. Let's look at the five things that Jesus commended them for. So that we are clear what is happening here so that we have it riveted in our minds that Jesus does not overlook some of the things that we treat casually. He sees them. Like we said a few weeks ago, he will be debtor to no man. And so if we do the right, he's going to see it, he's going to commend it. But doing some things right and the other things wrong does not exempt us from his judgment. And is here. He wants us to be complete. He wants us to be balanced. And if we have things pulling us down, note that Jesus is going to step in to correct us because he wants us to do our best to do the right. So in terms of the five things that he made mention, in terms of commendation, one works. And what is that? It's a Greek word, ergon, an act, any deed, things done. Yes, what is being conveyed here is the idea of working, working in the house of God, working to assist those that need assistance. And that general thought of working is being emphasized here. So when he talks about works, you know, it is doing things and implementing things for the kingdom and doing things to help a brother or to help a sister. Jesus sees these things and they mean much to him. Then it goes on to love. Uh, the Greek word agape, it speaks about affection. It speaks about goodwill. It speaks about benevolence. And we ought to have that one toward another. The, 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 the issue that he had with the church at Ephesus is that they did the works, but they did not have love. No, here with the church of Thyatira, they had the works, but they also had the love. So you will think that this would have been the perfect church, but no. He has some words for them in, in terms of <clears throat> um, rebuke, and we, are, we will come to that. But just to let us know that he saw that this was a working church, and he commended for it. He saw that this church had love. Affection, goodwill towards the brethren, love towards the brethren, brethren, benevolence they gave as the need arose. And that was good. They, they, they loved God and that was good. Then it went on to speak about, I saw, see your service. Service. And that's the Greek word diakonia. And it means ministry. It is important to be involved in ministry. Brothers and sisters, it is important. And Jesus saw that they were involved in ministry. They were doing what they are doing, whatever area you are in. Um, do it with all your might. Do it to the best of your ability. You are in ministry. And Jesus commended them for it. And then next, he saw their faith. In other words, 
the, 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 the things that they were teaching, the truth of the doctrine. They kept the word, they taught the word, they were living the word. They held on to the truth that they received. And remember now, you know, this church was in the time of the apostolic ministry when the apostle Paul was around. It was Paul along with Lydia that is said to have started this work in Thyatira. So they, their teaching and their embrace of the truth of the doctrine was commended by Jesus. And then he talks about their patience, right? The Greek word, hypomon. It was talking about patiently enduring, perseverance, sustaining. So man, this was a great set of things happening in this particular church. And Jesus commended them for every one of the things that he saw that was right. But there was a significant rebuke for them. But we stop here. When we pick up God's willing next week, we will go into the rebuke. And we will see that even with all the good things, the five things that Jesus outlined, positive, powerful things. Jesus had a word of strong rebuke. And remember, this church, Thyatira, the longest letter was written to them. And it had, I would say, the most severe letter. And the, yet these nice things were spoken about them. So we are, we are learning that with all the commendation and the nice things, the heavy weight is placed on the things that are wrong because the balance must be there. But I must stop. And I stop right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. God's willing next week, same time, we, we pick up so that we can complete this study on Thyatira and then extract the message that is in it for all of us. Before I pray, I have a few, or I will pray and then give some announcements. Very important that we catch these announcements. It has to do with church on Sunday. It has to do with convention that is coming. It has to do with, you know, the, the movements with the 100, amen, persons uh, that can come to church. So just give me a brief moment to go through this. But let us just bow our heads as we close Bible study in the name of the Lord with a brief word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your great and awesome presence. Mighty God, we thank you for allowing us to sit together one more time to participate in Bible study. I pray that the things that are presented tonight, we are on the subject of the churches in Revelation. Father God, I pray that the lessons to be learned will be learned by all of us. None of us are exempt, Almighty God. The things that affected and impacted the church, the churches then are affecting and impacting the churches now. And I pray and ask you to hold us, to continue to hold the churches in your hands. I pray that you will hold the saints of the Most High God, Mighty God, in your hands and lead and direct us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Help us to study these words. Help us to reflect over and over on these words until they become a part of us and we do what must be done to, to ensure that we are on the right path and we are upholding the apostolic word and we are vigilant with purity and with walking with God in true holiness. Have your own way in our lives. Have your own way in our midst. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Just before we go, saints of the Most High God, just want to remind us that um, come Sunday, all roads lead to the Olympia Crown Hotel where we have been, amen, since uh, over the last two weeks, amen. We have been there just glorifying God and having a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. And come Sunday, we continue there uh, just to let us know 
Amen. I will certainly have a word for us, you know, in short order as we go forward. But just to let us know that all roads lead to where we have been. Amen. Over the past two weeks. And then as we go, amen, on, go out on Sunday, we are aware that the Prime Minister has now allowed for not 50 but 100 persons to be out. Of course, we will now expand the, the space because the space is there for that amount and more. And we will allow for that. However, the process, amen, in terms of uh, determining who these 100 persons will be remains the same. We will have to call in. So I, I believe this coming Sunday, is it what? Groups one and two? I, I, I don't want to make a mistake. But whichever group it is, group, group three and four. Yes. So it will be group three and four. So whereas it would have been 50 persons and everybody call in for ensuring that you are in that 50, that process continue to hold. So what will happen when we reach the 100? Given the first 100 persons that call, we have a certain amount out of that 100 already, about 20 or 25 to cover for the band and the... Um, the, the worship leaders and the media team, etc., we have that amount. So the next 75, amen, the first 75 that call in will make up the 100, and that will be it. So for, as it is, group 3 and 4, right? So it will be group 3 in the AM, the first service, and then group 4 for the second service. So the first 100 for group 3, you will be on 9 to 10.30, minutes to 11. And the second service, which will be group 4, that first 100, you will be on from 11 o'clock till we are dismissed. And so the important thing, saints of God, is to call in and secure your space on a first come, first serve basis. Because we have to do it. There's no other way that we can do it that will be equitable saints of the Most High God. We, we feel so bad that it has to be done that way, but that's the, the way that we see best that will make it as transparent and as equitable as possible. And I pray that we all understand that. And having said that, comes the week after which is December, uh, November, sorry, the 28th. We kick off with Missions Convention 2021 in the name of the Lord. Uh, come Sunday, we will announce the theme and we will outline what is going to be happening and everything. But just to put us on guard, that comes December 28th, all road leads to Missions Convention. Only 100 people will be there for that Sunday, and uh, I'm not sure which group it will be, but we will make sure that it goes over so that all groups are able to come out and be a part of Missions Convention 2021. So by Sunday, you will get the details, but it kicks off in a big way, and it is going to be a major, mighty, massive Missions Convention, even with the 100 that comes out. Everything else will be via YouTube, and those who are unable to be in the sanctuary, please join us via YouTube or Facebook um, so that we can have a great time of fellowship and worship and togetherness. We ask that the saints be in prayer. Amen. And therefore, to that extent, comes Tuesday, which is next Tuesday and Wednesday. That's November 23rd and the 24th. That's next Tuesday. And Wednesday, there will be two days. We go 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening Tuesday. 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening Wednesday. Two days of fasting and prayer. And each of those nights at 6.30, we meet online for a prayer meeting. Saints of God, 
we are asking every saint, we will not just use the regular uh, Zoom link and platform that we have. We will get one that can accommodate three or 500. I want us to be there. The last time we said we want 200 persons to be on, believe me, we are in a season now. Saints of God, spread the word around. Everybody need to be at those two nights of prayer meetings. The 23rd and the 24th of November, next week, Tuesday and Wednesday. I will be talking to Sister Tisha to have that in place in terms of the link so that we can have three or four or 500 persons. Uh, I, but we must come on, saints of God. And those that I know that there are some folks without um, the ability to get on the platform, we are going to have to do something and find out how we can reach to them. But whatever has to be done must be done. We want every saint to be in prayer, and there is a reason for that. And so I encourage us to do that. Saints of God, the Lord bless you and keep you and have his face shine upon you. God make his peace rest upon you and upon your family in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.